um, because it's late in the day and I don't want to bore anyone. Okay. Much better. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. So this is a story about products from cannabis and hemp that work. So most of the questions in the conference that we see today, they are about does it work? Is it legal? How much is enough? How much does it cost? And everything related to what people are trying to address, they are trying to cure. So we have been at Folium Biosciences through this journey for six years now. We have created a plant material and a plant genetics that is 15 years old, highly rich in CBD and deficient in THC. And um, as a result of hemp and its extract, we have been able to create multiple products. These are the softwares that we have created that are designed for different indications. And um, my entire talk is based on what leads to designing the best products you can create for people who want to cure pain, inflammation, anxiety, sleep disorder, insomnia, nausea, and epilepsy or seizures. So this is an intro. This is the product that we are going to talk about and how we ended up here from hemp plant. Okay. All right. The, the talk is dedicated to uh, Ginger. Ginger is our uh, customer and a friend. And the, the left side of this picture was September 2017, when Ginger was suffering from stage 4 ovarian cancer. And the, oops, and the right side of the picture is April 2018, when Ginger was all but free from all symptoms of ovarian cancer. Now, this is where hemp and hemp products contributed. When Ginger was going through chemotherapy between September 2017 and May 2018, chemotherapy led to symptoms where she could not eat, she could not sleep, she lost all her hair. But what CBD did was it helped her cope with symptoms. It made her hungry, uh, hungry again, she could eat again, she was less anxious, and she could sleep, and therefore she could recover extremely fast um, with a CBD regimen that we gave her. So CBD did not cure cancer in this case, but it allowed her to cope with chemotherapy that led to her being free from cancer symptoms again. So this talk is dedicated to Ginger because um, a year after she finished her chemotherapy, she is still free and cl uh, clear from ovarian cancer. Okay, so um, how, how, do we make, how do we make the best products from hemp or cannabis? Uh, everybody knows that cannabis can do wonders, but you don't consume a plant, right? So what do you do with cannabis and hemp, and how do you go through the journey where you start with a plant and end with a pill or any product that you're trying to create? So we'll, we'll talk about endocannabinoid system, which is inside our bodies throughout this talk, and then we will move to discussion of phytocannabinoids. These phytocannabinoids are cannabinoids like CBD and THC that occur naturally in the plant material. We will go through a brief journey of their safety and efficacy data that has been published for over the past 40 years. And then we will talk about what it takes to design a good product. And um, we will also share some animal and clinical assessment of efficacy. So that's the outline of the talk. Now, the endocannabinoid system from 2005 to 2018, over the past 14 years, this is the most researched topic in biology and biochemistry. 
And this topic has led to hundreds of papers. There's nothing practically that was done comprehensively with endocannabinoid system before 2005. But after 2005, it's very well researched and lots of publications have come out as a result of those research leading to understanding of phytocannabinoids that can replace endocannabinoids. So this is really a very hot field. It continues to be so because of our interest in cannabis and hemp. For this talk, there was um, an invaluable resource that I've leveraged. And this resource is a PhD thesis that was published in Germany in 2012. And this thesis talks all about how aging can lead to different symptoms, illnesses, diseases, and how phytocannabinoids can address most of those aging-related uh, sickness or uh, symptoms. So this is a thesis that I've heavily leveraged in the preparation of this presentation. And um, this is something for you also to refer to because a copy of this can be downloaded from the internet. So a good lead here. Okay, so what's interesting with the endocannabinoid system, for, first of all, people, people want to know why cannabis works so well, right? Now, the reason why cannabis works so well is because it works like a key in a lock by working with endocannabinoid system. In this case, the first stage is where endocannabinoids are formed. Second case is where they are maintained in the body. And last but not least, this is destruction of endocannabinoids, how they die. So synthesis, maintenance, and destruction of endocannabinoids. In an endocannabinoid system, they are endocannabinoids, there are receptors and enzymes. These three things create the ECS. And ECS is all about how to maintain those three things. Receptors, cannabinoids, and the enzymes that destroy the cannabinoids. So once we understand ECS, or endocannabinoid system, we know how cannabis interacts with ECS and why it works so well, right? So this is an attempt to explain that. The, um, the two areas where um, phytocannabinoids, or CBD plus THC, work really well are neurological and immune system. The reason why cannabis works so well with neurological and immune system is because these are populated with the receptors that is one of the three integral components of ECS. The other two are endocannabinoids and enzymes. A balanced immune system is very rare. Mostly, our immune system is going through a set point. So when the immune system is overactive, you have autoimmune and allergies. And when the immune system is uh, um, very passive, that leads to underreaction. Cancer is one of the examples. Infection is another example where the immune system is not extremely active. So in order to create that balance, no, not over, not under, but just right, that's where phytocannabinoids, by replacing endocannabinoids, they play a very big role. And uh, this, this is one reason why we can explain that phytocannabinoids are able to not only modulate the immune system, but also the neurological system. This graphic does justice with that um, explanation. Okay, so, so what's happening in the nervous system, right? The next slide that I'm going to show you is very important because that basically sums up exactly what's happening and how CBD or THC works with our ECS or our body. So the next slide is probably the highlight of this presentation. It's a little complicated, but I'll try to explain what's happening here. Okay, so this is pain, right? Pain is felt through your nerves. And what's happening here is three things. Pain is felt at this extreme end. This is where you feel the pain. This is where the pain travels. And this is where pain is noted or registered. Three areas in uh, an inflammation or pain system inside our bodies. This is where you are feeling the pain. This is where pain travels. And this is where pain is registered. And all of these pain pathways are littered with CB1 receptors and CB2 receptor. 
So it's very interesting that the pain signal pathway or the pain trajectory is littered with CB1 and CB2 receptors. And if you can influence or modulate those receptors, the pain is either not registered or it does not travel or does not register in your brains. So there are many ways to either slow down the, um, the induction of pain or block the receptors uh, for the pain signal going to the brain. And that is why cannabinoids work so well in reducing pain, uh, either registry or uh, transmission of pain. So this is an example where in the pain pathway, a phytocannabinoid can interact with the receptors here and block it, here and block it, and here and block it. And that is why um, hemp or cannabis is so effective for pain and inflammation. So the CB1 and CB2 uh, receptors are involved throughout the pain pathway, and blocking them stops pain right in its tracks. Now, we have to ask ourselves, so if endocannabinoids, is, endocannabinoids are able to uh, modulate pain in our endocannabinoid system, then what if the endocannabinoids are replaced by the phytocannabinoids, the phytocannabinoids coming from cannabis or hemp? So if the CB1, CB2 are agonists, which are endocannabinoids, if they are lacking in your body, if you don't have endocannabinoids, but can you replace them with phytocannabinoids? And the answer is yes, to an extent you can. And then this entire talk is all about ECS, our endocannabinoid system, and how we can use phytocannabinoids to replace endocannabinoids. So what we don't have in our bodies, or what we naturally do not produce, we can replace or supplement through plants. Um, this example is... Um, for immune response, this uh, published paper talks about exactly what we just discussed for pain pathway, except that it's applicable to uh, inflammation. And most importantly, um, this research focuses on endocannabinoids, but it also points out or indicates that if your body naturally lacks endocannabinoids, then it can be replaced by the plant-based agonists or phytocannabinoids, like CBD. There's cancer research. The research is uh, on the right side, but uh, it again highlights what we just talked about, the pain pathway and the immune system in the previous slide. Same story. By influencing the receptors, if not through endocannabinoids, possibly by supplementing using um, phytocannabinoids, we can, in, in fact, modulate the cancer behavior. And by modulating the cancer cells or the behavior of cancer cells, we mean we can not only suppress the transformation of cancer cells, but also suppress cancer growth and decrease the supporting uh, fatty acid role by reducing their amounts. So there's very positive data on cancer suppression and inhibition of cancer cell growth using phytocannabinoids as well. So over these slides, you know that pain pathway, inflammation, um, cancer progression, there's just tons of literature on why phytocannabinoids offer so much potential for immune system related as well as neurological disorders. Okay. So if our endocannabinoid system doesn't work, then what do we do? Well, if it doesn't work, then um, use phytocannabinoids. And that's what this entire conference is about. People are trying to address something. It could be anxiety, it could be sleep, it could be pain, it could be serious stuff. And if they're trying to address something, and if the body itself is not able to handle or create endocannabinoids, then go ahead. Use a plant. Use phytocannabinoids coming from plant sources. They can be any plant, really, but cannabis and hemp is probably the most abundant plant in terms of uh, terpenes and cannabinoids that helps here. So this is one of our uh, pictures at Folium Biosciences. This is our genetics. This is what we use to create phytocannabinoids. Now, this um, uh, genetic is composed of 
five different chemical classes. And these five classes are phytocannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, alkaloids, and fatty acids. This is the plant that we use uh, with extremely high CBD and extremely low THC to create our products. The uh, terpenoids in this plant is this chemical category with its own uh, therapeutic potential. The phytocannabinoids in this plant is a combination of these phytocannabinoids with the top two, THC and CBD, being the most uh, abundant ones. Just to give you an idea, in our plant material, we have CBD at about 18 to 20 percent in buds and THC at about 1 percent in buds. And what we do here is that we extract our plant material and we remove THC. THC is removed through a process uh, that is known as chromatography. So we extract the plant material, we keep everything, and we remove THC. And that creates a CBD-rich, terpene-rich plant material that we use as a phytocannabinoid source to address different indications or uh, diseases. Um, monoterpenoids. This creates a very vital chemical class in our plant material or plant extract. And these terpenes are all known to be therapeutic. They have a very characteristic smell. But more than the smell, they are therapeutic because typically these four terpenes are well researched with the conclusion that the most abundant limonene is an antidepressant. And then we have Mersin that is anti-inflammatory. We have Linalool that is anti-anxiety. And then beta coreophyllin which is obviously anti-inflammation. So these terpenes are different classes. Um, they have typical smell. They range between a fraction of a percent to up to a percent in our plant extract, and they're all therapeutic too. So if you combine all the terpenes, alkaloids, flavonoids, and cannabinoids, you are creating really a very potent cocktail that can do various things. Okay, so what do we know about cannabis so far? Well, when we dig into the past and when we data mine, starting with 1960s, in this case, starting with 1972 with Hollister, and ending with recent studies in 2010, you will notice that there are seven or eight world-class researchers that have explored the safety and side effects of cannabis uh, over a long time. And what we know from these safety studies is that the period covered is four decades. I was born in 1972, so it's almost like as old as I am. Four decades of data. Um, hundreds of papers, these are just selected ones, exploring cannabinoids daily uptake of up to 1,500 milligrams per day leads to no significant side effect. So this is, this is extremely important because these are not spor sporadic studies. These are small, structured, placebo controlled, observational, clinical, all sorts of studies together. And everything together tells you that 40 years of data based on a range of cannabinoid daily consumption leads to no significant side effects. So that gives us confidence that we have done an essential toxicity as well as toxicology assessment and there's nothing to worry about from the safety or side effect perspective um, based on these studies. So the conclusions are um, uh, with respect to short term Long-term cognitive studies, there is no issue up to 1,500 milligrams of CBD a day. And therefore, if one were to design a product, you can knock yourself out. You can try with as little as 5 milligrams, and you can try as much as 1,500 milligrams. Um, another safety assessment for cannabis when we started was its addiction potential because people uh, typically are apprehensive. They don't know if they start cannabis, are they going to be forever hooked, like painkillers or opioid medication. And in this case, this chart basically shows that cannabis right here has a very active, a very low dose at which point becomes active, uh, at which point becomes effective. And the dependence potential or addiction potential is very low as well. So this bodes well. People in general don't get hooked or addicted to cannabis. It can be a hobby, it can be a lifestyle, but it's definitely not an addiction. All right, this paper was published in um, November of 2017. 
It was published on November 9th in 2017 by World Health Organization. It's, it's a very good read. It's about 30 pages. And it's in simple English with lots of good tables and charts showing uh, two things. The first is um, CBD is relatively safe with no reported deaths, adverse events, side effects whatsoever. And second, the therapeutic targets, the therapies based on CBDs, there's a long list. So if you look at this table is everything by WHO everything related to therapies that can be developed using CBD. So it's very impressive. And in, in summary, what they have mentioned is that um, once safety is cleared and efficacy is cleared, there should be a lot more clinical trials happening with CBD. So this is really good news by WHO, uh, and it was published about 14 months ago. And it's a good reference for those who don't want to read a scientific paper, but rather want a summary of everything in plain English or plain Greek. Okay, um, what we did was, um, after safety was done, we looked at efficacy data and we mined everything that was available to us, including going to professors and doctors privately to get access to clinical data that they were sitting on but did not publish. And uh, in doing so, we realized that we made a list of everything that was done where cannabis, uh, specifically CBD, was proven to be very effective. And um, a small list of those is presented in this table here, where you can start with Alzheimer's with about four seminal papers showing the power of CBD in reversing Alzheimer, not curing it, but at least to some extent reversing Alzheimer. And then moving on to Parkinson's, MS, epilepsy, neurological diseases, pain, anxiety, depression, cancer, nausea, etc. So the list is very long. And I can tell you that cannabis um, is promising in all areas, but in folium biosciences where we are trying to focus only on CBD, the most promising areas are, are uh, pain, anxiety, depression, nausea, epilepsy, and inflammation. So we try to focus on what we can handle, which is CBD without THC. And for those, we have six areas where the clinical data is extremely powerful, very powerful, and that is what we are, are trying to create products for. All right, so our data and the product design is based on 79 different trials. We looked at 79 trials. Uh, they were done over 8,000 patients. We collected all the evidence, all the data, you know, some very clear, some black and white, and some somewhat ambiguous. We collected everything. We created what we call a study of studies or meta-analysis, and we came up with, um, you know, a scatter plot, a hodgepodge of data that was not very clear, but when you combine so many studies, it becomes very clear that something directionally is happening, right? So this is what we did. We had over 79 trials, almost 7,000 participants. We realized that we want to create um, uh, uh, drugs, not drugs, but products for pain, chemotherapy, weight loss, appetite, sleep, as well as a type of uh, Tourette syndrome. So this is what we are trying to do. All right, so this, the goal is create a pill that works. Create something that works. Everybody is talking about cannabis, everybody talks about CBD, but, but where do you begin, right? So we wanna give people a pill. A pill a day, maybe a pill every two days, uh, but that will give them what they're looking for. Forget about the plant and cultivation and extraction and formulation and just take a pill, right? That, so that's the goal. Okay, so we talked to um, um, three uh, cohorts, three groups, the doctors, the patients, and consumers. And the reason why we talked to these three groups is because we wanted to be technical about developing the design of the product, but we also wanted to make sure that it's convenient and cheap and acceptable um, to the rest, right? So if you think about it, the doctor is the one describing that this is what, you, what I need in a product. If I, if I want to create a pill, then it has to be clinically efficacious. It has to be, one can demonstrate, one should be able to demonstrate that in clinics it will work. And the doctor also wants no toxicity, no adverse ev uh, events. It should be compliant. There should be all the paperwork to demonstrate that the quality is met, and so on and so forth. So, so this is the list that the doctor wants. This is the list that the patient wants. A patient wants a small pill, 
a patient wants something that's inconspicuous, not, not, not something like a vape pen where you have to take out and start vaping. A patient also wants something that is inexpensive. Um, so there are tons of things that we were looking at when we talked to the patient. And with the consumer, uh, there were other things that we weren't thinking of. Uh, for instance, there is a big cohort in, in US, 30% of our patients are, they prefer a vegan pill. And if you prefer a vegan or vegetarian pill, uh, the gelatin coming from cows is not acceptable, right? So we are looking at consumer side too, where we wanted to make sure that we use all the raw materials, all the ingredients that are socially and individually um, catering to a particular need. All right, so once again, this is the requirement of a CBD soft gel. Requirements from the doctor, requirements from the patients, requirements from the consumers. This is what we want to make, right? And on the left side, you will see that these are the requirements from the doctors, patients, consumers, and these are the attributes of a CBD soft gel that we want to make. We want to create a magic pill, a magic pill that works for everybody. But how do we translate a requirement or a request from the doctor, consumer, and patient into technical attributes of a product? Right, so that is uh, the left side into requirements, uh, leading to the right side into attributes. So if the doctor wants clinical efficacy, right, CBD has to be higher than X milligram. If a doctor is trying to treat a severe case of migraine, for instance, then we know that to treat migraine, the CBD needs to go through blood-brain barrier into your head. And that wouldn't be possible if you take CBD at less than 5 to 10 milligrams. Historically, we have seen that it only works at about 20, 30 milligrams or higher in a pill form. So we know that, okay, if the doctor wants uh, clinical efficacy for, let's say, migraine, then they should start at about 20, 30 milligrams, not 5 or 10. And therefore, X should be 25 or 30. So, so you can see why a list on the left can lead to numbers on the oops, sorry, numbers on the right, where everything is defined in terms of numbers or specific details. So starting with doctors, consumers, and patients, we have ended up with numbers against a list of attributes that defines what my product is. All right. So what we did was, uh, once we know that we wanted to create a pill, we also wanted to know, um, do we create an oil pill? or do we create something fancy and advanced? And that, the answer came to us when we were doing a couple of studies uh, with oil, this is the oil form, versus a water-soluble oil form. So this form is oil coming from hemp plant or cannabis oil, and this is cannabis oil with emulsifiers. So the top one is water-soluble, the bottom one is oil. What you will notice is that the top one, which is small oil droplet in water, is highly bioavailable, up to four times higher compared to the bottom one, which is not extremely bioavailable. So we said, <clears throat> we want to create a pill, but the pill should be filled with, with an advanced form. And the advanced form was, in this case, turned out to be a nano emulsion that we would prefer to be filled into these pills. And the not so advanced or traditional form is either the oil or, in some cases, liposomal based uh, form, which is not extremely effective. So the two advantages of using our product technology were, in this case, your absorption is four times higher. But in the case of an oil, the absorption, absorption is very low. Um, one big difference also is that when you take a product, if you take it in empty stomach versus full stomach, there's a big difference. If you take oil on a full stomach, it's not going anywhere. It's not getting absorbed very well. But if you take um, oil in an empty stomach, it does get absorbed. In case of a nano emulsion form, whether you have a full stomach or empty stomach, the absorption is somewhat consistent. So not only we are getting more absorption using a nano emulsion form, we are also getting a consistent absorption whether uh, the stomach is empty or whether it's full with food. So that was our technology platform that we wanted to use to create our soft gel. Okay, 
So this is a video where on the left side you have oil fill soft gel and on the right side you have our advanced formula in a soft gel. And um, when I play the video you will see that the diffusion or dissolution of the soft gel in a stomach fluid or simulated stomach fluid is drastically different from one another. So this video will tell you that the left side is obviously a primitive form, but the right side is an advanced form, which is what we plan to use in our pills. So this is obviously a time-lapse video. On the left side, the oil really does not go anywhere in a simulated gastric fluid. But on the right side, the um, water-soluble hemp oil pill dissolves in the liquid very quickly and as a result of quick dissolution the absorption is very high and that's exactly what we were trying to obtain and the result is consistent with our belief that an advanced formula dissolves fast and absorbs to a much larger extent um, uh, these are the technical character, uh, characteristics of the nano emulsion that I spoke about. Uh, it's very small. It's only about 25 nan nanometer, so it absorbs very quickly and uh, uh, works within an hour or so. So the size is really working to our advantage. The um, average size leads to high absorption. And then efficiency. Low polydispersity means it's very consistent. Everything is small, and that leads to a consistent absorption where there's no variation in consumer or patient experience. This is, again, uh, zeta potential. This basically means that once it's in a pill form, it's not going anywhere. It stays very stable because the oil does not become larger over time. Again, a technical criteria that was a result of a doctor's request, the pill should be at least, uh, pill should have at least 18 months of shelf life. And by working on zeta potential or double layer, we have 18 months of shelf life. Um, again, zeta potential of 40 to 60 says we have excellent stability and therefore a pill can be kept in your medicine closet for 18 months and it will still have the same property as on day one when you bought it. Um, so nano emulsion based platform leading to um, the pill, um, the biggest criteria is small droplet size leading to high absorption, then low polydispersity which is consistent effect. And last but not least, high zeta potential, which is stable quality. So these are the important uh, criteria that a pill will provide you uh, with advanced uh, nano emulsion platform, which uh, oil-based uh, soft gel will not. Um, some more criteria. In this case, this is an important plot because you will see that the advanced formula is blue line. The blue line is the nano emulsion-based advanced formula, and the red line is CBD oil directly. And this chart uh, tells you that oil gets absorbed over time in an animal study to a lot lower extent than uh, CBD nano emulsion in the pill form. So the blue form versus the red. Blue is the advanced formula, red is not advanced, and blue clearly in animal study after ingestion goes very high up and comes back down, but the absorption, net absorption is very high. So this was one of the results that we were trying to accomplish. The other result, four times by available in humans, the other result was, um, okay, so how, um, you know, how does it, in terms of numeric factors, how does it work? This is a study that was done on um, dogs. So we had 12 beagles, and they were, in, I'm sorry, they were dosed with uh, nano emulsion oil as well as uh, the CBD oil, and the absorption is two times higher in dogs. But it means that in humans, it's approximately four to five times higher. So clearly, you're getting more bang for your buck. You're getting more value for the money you spend for uh, CBD soft gels. And last but not least, I wanted to talk to, talk to you about onset of relief, how, how quickly it works. And um, in dog studies, the onset of relief uh, means um, the action is felt. And upon ingestion, the dogs felt the biggest effect after one hour in a nano emulsion form. But in an oil form, they felt the biggest effect after two hours. So the feeling, the onset of relief, the dogs feeling the effect of the advanced formula is twice as fast, one hour versus two hours. So these are some major attributes that describe why the pill with advanced formula is better for you. It is absorbed uh, to uh, four to five times higher extent. It is uh, consistent. 
in full versus empty stomach. It is going to lead to relief in, a, in an hour versus two hours with an oil, with an oil form. And uh, it is very predictable in terms of consumer experience. OK. So what we did was um, we looked at the historical data. And because now we are trying to say, OK, well, we have a pill. Um, we, have, we have these pills that, w that, you know, we know how to make them, right? But how much CBD should go in each pill? 10, 20, 50, 200? We just don't know right now, at this point. So we looked at the clinical data, and we realized that based on a collection of studies, these were effective levels, right? So let's look at the number one, pain. Every study that was done on pain hovered around an oil, CBD oil, uh, dose to the patients between 40 to 150 milligrams. That's a level, or that's a range that seemed to work. So we know that we want to be between 40 to 150 grams of CBD oil. But in a soft gel, if you are trying to create um, a formula, and if we know that a soft gel can deliver four times higher, the factor is a soft gel can deliver four times higher CBD in your bloodstream. And if the historical study based on CBD oil, oops, if this, OK, I lost it. If the historical study based on um, CBD oil is 40 to 150 milligram, then it should be four times less, 8 to 30 milligrams, because it's four to five times less compared to this number, right? So the factor is the pills are four to five times more effective, right? So whatever number you have here, the soft gel should have uh, at least um, you know, less than that. So if you have insomnia, if you have a study that shows that 160 milligram of CBD in an oil form works, then in a soft gel, only a fourth of it, 40 milligrams, should work. So we have done this chart based on dozens of studies. And this basically shows that all the effective levels, um, historical data, was available in oil form. And the soft gel levels were supposed to be four times lower. So this is really good news because you can go much farther with a lot less CBD. It's also good news because the patients are going to be able to afford uh, uh, something that will not cost them a lot. So we looked at these pain, five, five, uh, five indications, pain, anxiety, insomnia, nausea, and epilepsy, where CBD is very effective. And we realized that in every case for the soft gel, the strength should be between eight to 40, 50, or 60 milligrams of CBD for effectiveness. So when we realized that, we said, all right, so we know what works then how do we really create a CBD soft gel with what amount of milligrams of CBD, right? So we went ahead and we said, this is what we need to focus on. These are the numbers that work. And therefore, that all leads to a soft gel CBD amount that should be what? 25 milligram. We now know, <clears throat> we now know that um, we need something, something between 8 and 60. So if you are trying to address pain, then take one soft gel, because anything between 8 and 30 works. If you're trying to address uh, insomnia, then perhaps take two soft gels, which is 25 times 2, 50 milligrams, and so on and so forth. So creating a single soft gel with 25 milligram of CBD works. And it serves a pretty big group of patients who are looking for relief from different indications. Right? So, so we decided that we'll do 25 milligrams of CBD, and that should serve a pretty good group of patients. All right, so this is the platform. The platform is um, we have created a pill. And um, the first, uh, the first uh, pill, this one right here, is our basic CBD pill. The basic CBD pill is um, this pill right here. This is uh, CBD at 25 milligram level in a water-soluble nanoemulsion form. And um, it's, it's essentially, it's a combination of emulsifiers, which are polysorbates, terpenes, beta coreophyllin, etc., uh, phytocannabinoid oil, and carrier oil, which is a combination of MCT oil and olive oil. So based on um, ratio and formulation, we were able to create a basic CBD pill at 25 milligram that was good for multiple indications. But what about if I want to make a pill for pain and inflammation, right? So for pain and inflammation, we created 
um, a second pill where we have 25 milligrams of CBD and also 10 milligrams of curcumin from turmeric. And we have scientific data not only on CBD but curcumin as well. That at 25 milligrams of CBD and 10 milligrams of curcumin, it is very effective on pain. The reason why it's effective on pain is because CBD works through um, a nervous system or neurological system, whereas curcumin works locally, directly on the joints itself. And that is why CBD plus curcumin through independent pathways creates a very good solution for pain, uh, specifically you know, arthritic pain or um, uh, pain from fibromyalgia, etc. So, so a pill for uh, Pain and inflammation leads to um, curcumin and CBD, along with terpenes, emulsifier, and carrier oil, right? And so because this is a technology platform, because we are driven by the first principles, we were able to go and create even a pill for sleep or insomnia. And, and this is a um, um, sleep pill. We call it a sleep pill. It's good for sleep disorders and insomnia. It has 25 milligrams of CBD and one milligram of melatonin. Um, not five or 10, but one, because there's a reason why CBD and melatonin, they are uh, synergistic. You don't need a very uh, high amount. You only need one milligram of melatonin with 25 milligrams of CBD. Melatonin puts you to sleep in 20 minutes, and it keeps you asleep for four hours. And CBD will keep you asleep for up to eight hours. So if you combine two um, sleep aids in melatonin and CBD, not only it puts you to sleep in 20 minutes, it keeps you asleep for eight hours. So this is the advantage of why we wanted to create a synergistic system. And that synergistic system is a combination of um, CBD with melatonin along with emulsifier terpenes and carrier oil like MCT or olive oil. So, so this, is a, this is a graphic that tells you that we have a nano emulsion platform for creating pills. One pill for every indication. And um, there is no end, there's no limit. You can pretty much do what you want to do by being able to combine either the active pharmaceutical ingredients or botanical extracts. There are other uh, ideas that we are working on. A uh, very good idea that we are working on is a pill for anxiety or depression. And that pill is using the same concept, but uh, it's mixing CBD with um, a chemical called GABA, G-A-B-A. -A, and CBD with GABA is extremely good for anxiety or depression. And um, that will be the you know, fifth or sixth skew of the product that we are developing. In addition, there are other products. So sky is the limit. If you feel that you can use a combination of active ingredients, then this is the platform for you. So, so uh, in a nutshell, um, we have created uh, multiple pills, uh, but more importantly, we have created a platform where a pill can be created upon demand. So if you want a custom product, or if you want something very unique for a niche group of patients, then we can use the same technology, but tweak the formulation just a little bit for it to serve a certain patient group or a certain indication that we are trying to address. All right. So almost the end of my talk. Um, so we were able to create something that was THC free because um, we use our CBD oil where THC has been removed. And all of a sudden, because it's THC free, it is accessible and acceptable uh, by kids, older adults, um, religious folks. Uh, a lot of people don't like psychoactive uh, molecules. They don't like drugs. And by taking THC out, this is acceptable to 90% of, uh, of our patients. Um, this is water soluble and therefore it's highly bioavailable, highly effective and leads to um, uh, predictable absorption and therefore predictable effect in consumers. Highly efficacious as a result of absorption. Pharmaceutical grade, this is because it's made by um, uh, quality systems being followed that makes us GMP compliant. So we have good manufacturing practices leading to compliant systems, leading to pharmaceutical grade product. In other words, you can always say that if it's supposed to be 25 milligram CBD pill, it is always going to be 25 milligram CBD pill. Those numbers are solid and you can take it to the bank. So we feel uh, good about being able to call it pharma grade. Convenient which is what the patient and the consumer wanted. 
and inexpensive. The reason why it's inex inexpensive is because now since this pill delivers four times higher CBD in your bloodstream, you need four times lower than a conventional clinical trial will show. And therefore, we were able to knock the price down by a factor of four. So in other words, our mantra to get to every consumer out there uh, in US was, if it costs less than a dollar per day, per pill, per patient, then we have uh, been successful. And everything that we have made to our patients costs less than a dollar per day. So we are able to say that, yes, we are able to get our pills out to everybody. Uh, we've been successful in making sure that nobody is unable to buy these pills because we are using too much CBD and it's too expensive. Um, so that was, you know, another goal that we wanted to get to because if we were to fight against the pharmaceutical industry, we are going to have to create a product that is uh, acceptable and affordable by everybody. And that goal was met as well. Okay. So... Um, so the, in conclusion, you um, know about the ECS system. The endocannabinoid system is obviously um, very uh, well-researched, lots of publications in the last 15 years, and as a result of renewed understanding, there's so much more that we know now versus 15 years ago, we were able to leverage everything that we know into a knowledge that went into product design. Oops. Um, we know that phytocannabinoids, CBD, as well as THC can be used for replacing endocannabinoids because of which our ECS system leads to several disorders. Most of them are neurological or immune system based. We know that safety and toxicity data is acceptable based on 40 years of data through dozens of researchers. We know that efficacy through uh, study of studies or meta-analysis is extremely promising. And last but not least, we were able to distill everything down into a platform, which was water-soluble nanomotion platform, leading to a pill that was highly effective across different indication categories. So this was a story where I wanted to tell you where we started and where we ended up in our quest to create a product that would offer something for everybody. And so far, we've been successful, and we continue to build on that success by offering new pills for different areas. OK, so this was a quick talk. I appreciate your uh, attention. And uh, I hope it made sense, um, because, because most of us, uh, including this expo, most of us are wondering whether it works or not, right? But we can't really tell them whether it works or not unless we give them a product to use. And that's the biggest question we have. Um, okay, we have heard so much about it. Is it legal? How much does it cost? And beyond that, does it work? And what do I do? Where do I buy it? So we've been, we've been able to create a solution where somebody can use it if they wanted to. And uh, before, a couple of years ago, before we came out with these pills, there was nothing for our patients to use. So luckily we have a solution and we continue to build more solutions for different patient groups. So I'm available for Q&A if you have any questions. Yes. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, presentation. I wanted to, to ask you in one slide, uh, you mentioned that uh, uh, if the endocannabinoid cannabinoid system uh, is not working, whether we can use phytocannabinoids. Yes. And you mentioned, yes, perhaps. <laughs> so are there any cases that it's not working? Uh, <coughs> and, this, and my second question was in another slide, you mentioned about uh, 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 the a study of, from the World Health Organization right. that, uh, uh, where you mentioned that uh, uh, it is, uh, uh, CBD is relatively safe. So I, I paid attention to the relatively. It's, is there any risk? I thought that it was 100% uh, safe. Thank G you. Great, yeah, great question. So the, so the first question was, phytocannabinoids should be able to replace endocannabinoids. But if you look at endocannabinoids, they look nothing like CBD or THC. So endocannabinoids called anandamide, 2-AG, uh, AEA, they are very different molecules. They look nothing like CBD or THC. We are just lucky that phytocannabinoids tend to behave like endocannabinoids. So because they're totally different molecules, we have to assume that in most cases they will work. 
um, because um, using the data that we have, they kind of sort of work similarly, but not quite. Very different molecules. So it depends on what we're trying to do. Are you trying to cure cancer? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a tall order, but if you're trying to do something based on your assumption that the phytocannabinoids would be able to simulate or replicate the endocannabinoid behavior when it binds to the receptor, that's really a leap of faith. We are assuming. We wouldn't know unless we try it. For all the things that we have tried, it kind of sort of works, but it's not 100% correlation. So that's uh, the first answer. The second answer was um, the WHO's uh, conclusion on safety of CBD. The, so far, all these studies have been small scale and observational. There is no placebo controlled, double blinded study that uh, has been done to show that CBD absolutely has no side effects, no adverse events, no toxicity, etc. So a compilation of study, study, a compilation of everything that we know tells us that there is no cognitive effect, there's no psychometric effect, there is, there's, there's nothing that we can observe. But that is only based on small scale and observational trials that have been done so far. There's not a well-planned, structured, well-funded, placebo-controlled, double-blinded study that will tell you for sure and that is why we say that, you know, um, but, you know, that's as good as it gets. We have 40 years of data. I feel very confident, but if I wanted to sell it to EU, EMA, or FDA in the U.S., they won't buy it. They will say that you have to do your own trial to demonstrate safety and efficacy, which is why I said it's relatively safe, but don't count on it because a structured study has not been done. Sure. Please. Um, okay, so, so, um, so the immune system is um, like a thermostat, you know. Uh, the immune system is driven by hormones and chemicals uh, which are synthesized and degrade. So if, if your imu immune system has a set point, you know, which is a horizontal line, it goes like this, right? And um, the synth synthesis and... Uh, decay of the hormones triggering the immune system could be like this, right? And um, the control uh, is, is triggered by the endocannabinoid binding with the receptor that create the enzymes that start the destruction of hormones leading to the immune system's functioning. So um, my point is that I cannot tell you specifically what is happening, where the phytocannabinoids can control your immune system while variations. But I know that that's been observed. Now, the reason why I cannot tell you in detail as to what exactly is happening is because the immune system is composed of three different uh, components. Um, so receptors, enzymes that create and kill endocannabinoids, and endocannabinoids itself. So the, out of the three, there's so much variation that it has not been studied very well. So we don't know exactly why it's happening, but we know it's happening. Yes. Excuse me, but there are also glial cells in the central nervous system which are important in the immune uh, uh, participation in diseases of the central nervous system and neurodegenerative diseases. Yes. So actually, I'm really confused in the sense that solid, when we are used to being sold products, and actually, by, uh, maybe there was another presentation with more details about where uh, this, these phytocannabinoids work on, on uh, peripheral or central nervous center uh, uh, receptors, mm -hmm. and I didn't get it. But this presentation was more like, if I was uh, studying like management or I was acting as a consumer. Right. So in a way, it's not, someone is asking me to, um, because I also noticed the relative. Uh, um, yes. The, uh, the, the other, the, yes. Uh, he said, so someone is asking me to be, uh, when there has not, there have not been uh, the studies um, that the big scale uh, studies that we want, uh, usually in order to be, uh, to have some certainty, especially of neurotoxicity, someone is asking 
and especially producers of, of product are asking me to, um, to be confident yes. from observation. But what I found out in medical school was that don't be the first and don't be the last to use a, med a medicine. Right. Don't be the first, but don't be the last also. When there are um, other uh, products, and I'm not going to, uh, 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 very far from my uh, intention, is to, um, uh, to support the uh, big pharmaceutical uh, calls with the, um, con the um, conventional f pharmacy. Right. Um, what I, I'm saying is that I'm, I don't have it at all clear where uh, these phytocannabinoids, what they do with the recept with which receptors they react, and what they they actually do, right. it's an uncertainty. And on the other hand, uh, I don't feel that um, governments also, um, in a way, uh, um, help the 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 majority of people who don't have medical uh, knowledge. Because it is, and when it comes to down result, it's just that some people, somebody is producing and we are all consumers. I would like more information about what kind of receptors they, they, they act on and uh, um, uh, what, why should I prefer for a single migraine, let's say, conventional, uh, not conventional, uh, uh, I mean, uh, v um, these products uh, in, in versus the conventional product, which we have some experience and we know that what side effects they we will expect. I'm sorry it be, if it no, became... No, it's, it's totally uh, okay. It, it became... Um, so, I'm sorry. No, absolutely. I think, I think you raise all the valid points. Um, now... One of the big forces driving the acceptance of cannabis was because the pharmaceutical drugs either did not work, they were addictive, or they cost too much, or um, there were other reasons, right? So the first thing first, you mentioned that there was not enough um, uh, definitive clinical uh, conclusion, research, data, etc. Well, that's what we have done. We have been data mining um, for a long time. Um, there's a lot of data, but there's no, there are no structured trials. So we know a lot, but we have not really applied that knowledge, uh, or we have not really distilled or translated that knowledge into creating products that are safe or effective. Uh, but we know a lot, because the research has been done for 40 years. By the way, I'll give you my card, and I'll give you, if you write to me, and, um, I'll give you an access to a literature that has hundreds of papers, hundreds of papers. And um, this is what I do. I collect information, especially from credible sources, and I translate that. And that information translated into technology and product design is what uh, we have been doing for the past five years. Um, the key is that there was a demand. FDA was not delivering. It would take a drug, drug product $1 billion in five to 10 years to come to market. And if the kids are suffering from seizures and epilepsy, do you want to wait five to ten years? And there was, there, there was a demand in the market that uh, was a pent-up demand looking for these products. And we just delivered. We delivered especially uh, swiftly because unlike pharmaceutical firms, we were not making new chemical entities. If you are making new chemical entities, you have to look at safety, you have to look at toxicity, you have to spend five years making sure that it's safe. Uh, we were taking something from nature that has been consumed for thousands of years. And therefore, relatively, we were comfortable that this stuff is not new, it's been around forever, and we are just tweaking its form to make it more of a consumer product. Um, so that's what we have done. I can't really give you the biochemistry answers because I'm not a biochemist myself, but I can get you access to hundreds of papers that I've read so far so you can educate yourself. Yes. Biochemically, that we have partial antagonists. We can Absolutely. Those, but we don't have total. That's why we, we cannot be so. Uh, we don't have the tool in, in future if we do have. On the other hand, the, the only thing I will want to say, and I won't, don't want to occupy it with here, I want to say this that if, um, if there is, let's say, a child with epilepsy, and we have very, very, very good medical access to anyone uh, indifferent of 
Right, right, absolutely. Yes, but it's not addiction. But if it's a lifestyle and it's a demanding lifestyle, then it is in a way a psychological addiction. So there are other things to consider. It is complicated, and I would like this to be done in, in universities. I would like people to be in their communities to be very, very demanding of what they demand from society. I would like that. Absolutely. Point taken. Um, these are all points that we raised uh, when we started our research six years ago. But the reality is that it's a hybrid approach, right? Governments play their role. Pharmaceutical companies do what they do, and our industry is doing what we're doing. Um, and, it's a, and it's an approach that is going to evolve over some time. Pharmaceutical companies will not, they will never support us because, because they did not create this molecule and therefore they cannot own patents on this molecule and therefore they cannot make money out of it. So we have to do something ourselves. I'm sorry? Absolutely. Point taken. Uh, yes, please. Do you have a question? Well, um, so the, uh, a big assumption in, in your question is, um, is the effect proportional to a drug in your bloodstream, right? Um, and, um, you know, one of the ways I will answer that is that with the water-soluble nanoemulsion in your blood, CBD in your blood goes very high and comes back down uh, quickly too. So um, the, one of the terms we use is called half-life, right? And the half-life is shorter for the water-soluble nanoemulsion emulsion than it is for the oil form. So you're right, you get much higher absorption in your blood, and, but your half-life is much quicker versus oil. Now, take it for what it's worth. Because I couldn't tell you that at half-life and beyond half-life, it stops working. Because I don't know, based on published data, at what blood concentration it stops working. Because nobody has defined efficacy, or it's defined differently for different indications. So there's no clear answer. But I will tell you that the nano emulsion works quickly, and it dissipates quickly in bloodstream as well. Thank you very much for coming. No problem. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Maybe if you want to continue.